everybody. Um, thank you so much for being here. My name is Lisa Litzy. I am a program manager for the Institute for Urban Education. Um, and we are going to go and get started right away. Um, and so the first thing that I'd like to do um, with you today is sort of situate this uh, session around students. So um, sit back for a few minutes and I'd like you to watch this video um, because as we move through this very brief hour that we have together, um, I really wanna put students at the center of what we're gonna be talking about. Culturally responsive education for me is the understanding that children are people and without building relationships and without understanding children, we can't teach them. When I'm trying to find myself or find my identity, I go towards art and I go towards poetry, but I feel like when I'm in the school system, they always try to define you by your numbers. It was the first day of biology class and the teacher in her Southern accent was just like, all right, I'm just gonna get this off my chest now. I'm not gonna remember any of your names, you know, because all of you got the same hair color and the same eye color. Growing up, I had a really hard time finding an interest in reading. A lot of the literature that we read talked about topics and experiences that were not that relevant to me. The closest we would come to was probably the narratives of immigrants who came from Ellis Island, but even then, there was still some kind of disconnect. I remember noting that these people were welcomed here, whereas my community, they're shunned. When a few other students and I had approached different uh, history teachers specifically about teaching about LGBTQ culture, either we got the response from teachers that they didn't feel comfortable teaching about LGBTQ history, because they didn't identify, or we got the response that they're against teaching LGBTQ history within schools. When I began teaching, I thought I had to know everything, and I had to control everything. I need to assign your seats, tell you when you can get up, lecture to you, write down all of these things, regurgitate it back to me, and if you did that, fantastic. And nothing about your culture was welcomed into the classroom. Yo he vivido en carne propia. Yo he visto y escuchado cómo los maestros hablan de los niños. Cada día dice llegan los niños y no traen un lápiz o a veces no traen los cuadernos y muchos niños llegan con hambre. Muchos niños llegan con problemas en el hogar y yo no tengo tiempo para estar tratando con esos niños. I had over an hour and a half commute every day just to get to middle school in eighth grade. And I was always late. I was always late. I was always sleeping. I was tired. I was depressed. And not once did he ask me why. My parents stopped going to parent-teacher meetings in middle school. A lot of the teachers just went with that, right? That they didn't think, okay, well, this 12-year-old is filling out all these forms and also just signing her parents' name. There was no effort to make them a part of this world. In una conferencia de padres, en el primer grado. Estaba teniendo dificultades para la pronunciación de algunas palabras. La única pregunta que ella me hizo fue que, qué idioma hablábamos en casa. Así que cuando yo le contesté que todos hablábamos español en casa, ella dijo que probablemente ese era el problema y ella no tuvo ninguna otra respuesta. In New York City, 85% of students identify as Black, Latinx, or Asian. We know that across the country and in New York, 60% of the teaching force is white. There were a couple black teachers, guidance counselor, assistant principal that came into the school and often left like within a year. We are often asked to be the dean. And of course, if we're not the dean, then we're the assistant principal who takes care of discipline. You're not letting us build those relationships. The way that we've been teaching comes from the 19th century factory system. When we say decolonizing our practice and decolonizing education, it is first questioning what you think is normal and right and the way that it should go. Question, where did this come from? When was the last time a student learned about Haiti? When was the last time a student learned about Colombia? Mm, por ejemplo, mis hijos sí han viajado a México. Han tenido la oportunidad de convivir con la familia que está allá. Y hay tantas cosas que Cada vez que van, ellos vienen sorprendidos porque no la conocen. <laughs> y va más allá del, de, la, de los tacos y de los mariachis. I want everyone to be able to know, along with myself, about my heritage. I want people to be able to say 
where they are from without it having to be kind of like a personal question, a question that you ask a friend. The way you teach, how you teach it, and why you teach it. From what perspective are you teaching? The biggest thing is that people, educators, don't want to address race, gender, power, and privilege. I remember one time uh, when I first began to get South Asian students into the classroom. There was a young girl who came to the classroom and her parents had put Mindy on her hand. I said, oh honey, you shouldn't be writing on your hand. And then she explained to me that it was part of um, the celebration for either Eid or Diwali. I had to reach out to the families to find out what it was about, understand their culture a little bit more. Um, I tried to bring in a way that we could celebrate those cultures into the classrooms. Welcoming families in. Having um, teachers and staff come out of the school building to really learn about the communities that they're in. Muchos padres deberían de involucrarse porque nuestros niños están sufriendo. Porque mis hijas mismas, al verme a mí involucrada y con la pasión, ellas se apasionan. As our country is becoming more and more diverse, we need to use the indigenous practices of storytelling, of music, of conversation. It's not like I have 52 different countries and three languages, so I have to figure out how to CRE. No. All of those students come from an indigenous culture that values community, that values cooperation. And that's how you start to engage students in CRE. We created an all boys class and we also created like boys reading groups at that time. They read Decoded by Jay-Z, which is his memoir, and they also read the autobiography of Malcolm X. I don't think it's a, it's a coincidence that that was also the same year that we just shot up in terms of our academic growth across the board. I've been very fascinated with the idea of students doing the teaching. Me very much pulling away from the board. I try to make sure that students feel like they have a sense of agency in the math. I ask them to think critically about the math that's in front of them. A lot of kids feel as if it's about like SATs, ACTs, getting these high grades and they don't develop their individuality. It's like that carbon copy. But you're forgetting that you're human. Like, find that thing about you that makes you different from everyone else. When we negate people the opportunity to learn their, their legacy and what brought them into this world, we don't give them the space to fully love themselves. Our goal is for our kids to graduate from us with a, with a, with a level of consciousness, conscious of who they are and what they bring to the table, conscious of their history and conscious of the world that they live in and how to navigate that from a place of strength. That's cultural responsiveness. It's challenging the adults in the building to do right by every child and therefore doing right by themselves. All right. Um, so take a moment to uh, just have like a turn and talk with the person around you. Um, and what are your thoughts? Um, how did that video impact you? So I'm going to give you about two minutes. I'm going to put on my little timer. Go ahead and just talk about what you thought about that. All right. Uh, if you all can come back, that would be great. Um, so the reason that I showed that video um, is that I really wanted to put students at the center of this session, and they talked about culturally responsive education, and the Institute for Urban Education, that's sort of the uh, foundation of what we do. So um, as we move on, I'm just going to quickly tell you a little bit about who we are, who, who is the IUE. Um, we are a UW-Milwaukee um, grant-funded uh, program that lives at UWM, and we, for clinical placements, offer student teaching and internships. So um, we offer student teaching in Milwaukee, Waukesha, Racine, and West Dallas, and then recently we have internships in Racine, West Dallas, and starting in fall of 2023, uh, Milwaukee Public Schools is also jumping onto the internship bandwagon. Um, and so, as you can see, um, most of these uh, student teaching and internship opportunities accept all grade levels and content areas. One of the things that we don't do, though, is dual placements where you have to split nine weeks and nine weeks or 18 and 18. Um, most of them, we have a, a really brief IUE application. Um, you know, uh, if you want an internship, you have to be recommended by your campus uh, uh, clinical coordinator. And there's a few more. It's a little bit more accelerated teaching responsibilities. But um, if um, 
people decide to come through the IUE, they get eight um, biweekly culturally responsive practices cohort sessions um, and supervision is usually provided. So just in case you didn't know what the IUE was, that's who we are. And we take students from all different UW system schools. Um, most students decide to do this because they either want to end up in the Southeastern Wisconsin corridor of the state, or maybe they are from there and would like to teach in an urban school district. But these are the districts that we partner with. Probably wondering who I am. Um, I have worked for 20 years in Milwaukee Public Schools prior to this role. I spent nine years teaching fourth grade and then sixth through eighth grade science with most of my time in seventh grade. Once my principal put me up into middle school, I did not want to go back down. And a lot of people say I'm crazy for loving middle school, but I absolutely fell in love with middle schoolers, even though they're unstable. <laughs> um, after teaching for nine years in a very high needs school, I went on to mentor new teachers and train new mentors for the next 11 years for Milwaukee Public Schools. So I mentored teachers in everything from K-3 to high school physical education. So it was good teaching is good teaching. Um, and you all know what you're teaching. It's all I did was help with the theory into practice. And then I've been working for four and a half years with UWM uh, with the Institute for Urban Education. And the three pictures on the slide are my children, um, and they are my reason for doing what I do. And on the top is my um, soon-to-be 15-year-old Addison. This is Bria. And on the bottom is my 18, almost 19-year-old in February, Jalen. Um, and so a lot of uh, why I do what I do is for them. All right, so let's get started. Um, you guys are going into your student teaching at sort of a, a odd time, right, um, next week or in the next couple of weeks in January, where these classes have been functioning now for an entire semester. The person that is hosting you may or may not have had a student teacher uh, in the fall semester. Um, but because uh, things are already in motion and systems have been put into place and you're really coming in mid-year, we really want to think about how you can create some really great connections with your students because you're not starting at the beginning of the year when teachers do a lot of get to know you things, right? So we're going to talk a little bit about how to do that today. All right, let's break it down. Let's just look at a definition, right? What is authentic and what is connection, right? So authentic meaning be genuine, be real, be true, be meaningful, and be your original self. Connection, definition, relationship interconnection, bond, tie, or attachment. An authentic connection is a genuine connection with someone else. You drop the facade, you show some vulnerability, which is not always easy to do as a teacher because you have to be the one in charge, but it's really sharing some pieces of one's true self. And ways to begin creating those connections include sitting with somebody else's emotions, showing interest in them, and listening deeply without a motive. So what I'd like you to do is take a minute and just talk to somebody near you about who was your favorite teacher? Like who is your most memorable teacher from school? It could be from K to 12. And do you feel like they were memorable because you had an authentic connection or not? And have you had authentic connections with any of your teachers? So turn and talk to somebody either behind you or next to you. I can actually see you guys now, hi. <laughs> um, so take, um, I don't know, let's take like three minutes and let's share. Hopefully you had some good conversations around who you, your favorite or most memorable teachers were and chances are it's because you had some sort of authentic connection with them, right? And so why are they really important? Um, so research shows that, you know, the quality of our relationships are directly linked to your happiness, your well-being, your self-esteem. Children really learn best when they feel seen, heard, valued, and safe. And the honest truth is that kids aren't gonna learn much, if anything, from people that they don't trust, right? Or people that they don't know very well. So there's a, there's a foundation for why it's really, really important to try to have close relationships with all of your students. But with that being said, before we th think about how to create these relationships, there's a few things that you just wanna keep in mind, right? You're going in in January, these students already have a relationship with their primary teacher, right? And potentially maybe a student teacher who was there before you. But it, building these authentic relationships takes some time and some effort, right? So it's not an easy thing necessarily all the time. Sometimes it is effortless. You've met people like that in your life where you just click 
And it's going to be like that with some students, but it's also not going to be like that with some students. So just because you have a strong relationship with your students also doesn't mean that you're not going to have management or behavior issues. We all have our days. Um, relationships are a start, but are alone not enough to carry you with your management and your behavior strategies, right, that you've been thinking about from your classes and your previous experiences. Um, you and your students are going to still make mistakes. So have grace on yourself and have grace for the students. And this is so true. And even the best teachers can't always form strong, authentic relationships with every student. There's just some students that no matter how much I tried, you know, we just didn't connect on a really, you know, profound level. But but one thing is, is they can never know, right? They can never know that you're just not quite there. So you got to just try your best. And then in th these relationships involve forgiveness, acceptance, some give and take, and the willingness to work at it. And really, as an adult in the classroom with children, it, the onus lays on you. You're the person who really has to model that forgiveness, acceptance, the give and take, and model the willingness to keep working at it, right? Because you're going to be tired. You're going to be overwhelmed, and you're going to want to just be like, I can't. I don't have the energy to do this. But you have to sort of dig deep and try to figure out how to problem solve through some of the things that are happening. And relationships are the doorway to being able to do that. All right. So here's just a couple of ideas. And then what I'm going to ask you guys to do is add to this. OK, so when it comes to being authentic, just remember to be yourself. Students can read directly through you. I mean, they literally will size you up in probably the first two minutes that you're in that classroom. Doesn't give you a lot of time, but they can really see through you. Being authentic and truly meeting them where they're at, you have to get to know them, right? Beyond some surface level things, including things they're passionate about, that can make all the difference. So saying hello and goodbye every day. Or you've seen uh, videos with teachers who have special greetings, like with each of their kids. That's totally up to you, right? But you get to decide. But acknowledging someone's existence is a very most basic relationship builder. So just saying hello and goodbye every single day to all of your students. It acknowledges that you actually see them. I, I added this one. I, saying please and thank you went a long way with uh, respect with middle schoolers for me. So when I ask them to, uh, you know, hand in their papers or stand up and push in their chairs or whatever they did, I just said, please and thank you when doing, asking them to do something. It just implies respect. Um, you've probably heard this one. You want to call home for good behavior more often than bad. And then the other thing to think about is when you do call home for good behavior or bad, you want to make it about the choice and not the person and not the student. So if Billy threw a chair across the classroom and you're talking to Billy's parents, it's not that Billy's a bad kid, it's that Billy's choice was not a good choice, right? So we want to make it about the choice and not the person. A lot of teachers, when they first get into a classroom, you might want to do like a questionnaire with your kids. I did this in the beginning and then I let them sit in a stack on my desk and I didn't know how to use them. So that's one thing that I want you guys to think about is if you decide to do a questionnaire or a survey or some sort of activity, how are you then going to use that information? Um, you have to decide how much you want to let students inside your own little world to your comfort level. I pretty much let my students know about my life, my, my children. They asked me how old I was and where I was from and where I went to college and all of that. I didn't mind sharing any and all of that, right? You have your own boundaries and your own comfort level. But they do want to know, and the more you share, they're going to be like, oh, you're human too, yeah? Like, you don't sleep at school. Some, some, when I was little, I thought my teachers lived at school. Um, believe and say that they're going to do great things every day in some way, shape, or form. And then be authentic and have fun because really life is too short and have a dance party, do whatever. And then listen and validating their feelings. So I'm going to leave this up here, and then I want you guys to talk about what these things either might look like right? What might you do with some of those? What kind of activities are you planning? I'd like you guys to share with each other. How are you planning to get to know in your students and create these relationships? Um, I'm going to give you about five minutes. So you'll have a good amount of time to talk to each other, share some ideas, make sure maybe you have a pen or a notebook. If you hear something that someone's doing that you're like, hey, I want to try that. Great. 
So I'll start with five minutes and we'll see how it goes. And if we need less time, great. If we need like another minute, not a problem. All right, so how are you gonna get to know your kids? All right, I hope that you were able to share some ideas and get some ideas from other people about how you're going to start creating those authentic relationships. Um, I'm going to be sending this presentation to Kelly, um, and so you will be able to access these links. I found you know, these were my favorite sites of um, things to do that seemed um, appropriate. They span different grade levels and ages, but ways to build relationships with your students. Um, and then there is a site on here called Learning for Justice, and it's really a social justice-centered um, site. Um, but if you um, do end up coming across teaching topics that are about race, power, privilege, gender, this is a fantastic site with tons of lesson plans and support and ideas for how you'll be able to navigate sometimes those tricky waters. Um, I'm not gonna open these and go over them now, but you guys will have access to those. So here's some things that I want you to think about. Um, I want you to consider if the activities you maybe just talked about or things that you're thinking about, do they center sort of the white, straight, middle-class upbringing? Um, and for example, like family tree activities, I personally am adopted. And so whenever we did these family tree activities, I never really felt comfortable doing it. I didn't tell my teachers about it. Uh, I don't think my teachers ever knew. It wasn't a deal breaker for me, but I just never felt comfortable doing a family tree activity um, because I didn't at the time know who my birth parents were. And I could have certainly, and I did, I did a family tree about the, the family that adopted me, but it just, I don't know. It just made me feel strange. Um, so it, it's not something that, you know, some kids may, may not admit that. Right. But I, I think in thinking about the activities that you implement, um, how, how might kids that have different backgrounds respond? So uh, number two, you know, when we talked about those surveys and questionnaires, what are the questions like, right? Are they invasive? Do they ask lots of personal questions or are they, you know, a little bit more broad in general? Um, I, I, I learned this one through experience. Um, I used to do the, what did you do for winter break? What did you do for summer break? You know, um, prompts and journal prompts. And what I found out is that school breaks are not always relaxing and fun for students. And that actually a lot of kids are not safe and not fed enough during their time out of school. Uh, so if they go a whole week over spring break without really eating much, they don't wanna come back to school and tell you that. They will not tell you that. They'll tell you what they think you wanna hear. So I just want you to be, mindful of thinking about uh, putting kids in those positions. Uh, again, assuming that they have a mom and dad in the home or a mom and dad at all, right? Uh, lots of different family structures. And this, all of these things I want to tell you transcend race, right? They are across racial groups. They are across socioeconomic groups. So we're not just talking about uh, Black students or Hispanic students or Asian students. We're we're talking about all kids here, right? Um, the what do you want to be when you grow up conversations? I know this one's kind of controversial because some teachers say, hey, it's really good to have a goal, right? And a focus. But what I learned is a lot of my kids, kids couldn't see past their current reality and they were really surviving day to day. And what, what that conversation did to them was put pressure on them. Uh, so we, we broke it down into micro goals. What's your goal for today? Oh, okay. Maybe what's your goal for this week, right? Maybe what's your goal for this school year? And it really depends on the student. And that's where creating these authentic relationships and really getting to know your students is so important. Uh, the what do you want to be when you grow up conversation is not always a comfortable conversation if, you know, they're living in a family with adults who maybe are doing things that they shouldn't be doing, right? Oh, I want to grow up to be like my dad who does X, Y, and Z, right? Number six, gender assumptions of activities. You know, that sort of a, a lot of books, you're going to find it as you start looking at your curricular materials, depending on who the, when they were published, 
you know, they boys are playing the sports and girls are dressing up and doing makeup, right? And like, there's these stereotypical gender role type stuff. So think about, you know, the materials that you're presenting with your getting to know your students. And the last one is interesting. It's, it's we wanna watch for activities that demand conformity to sort of achieve a goal, right? Like teamwork's not a bad thing, but if the only way that a student can achieve a goal is by conforming to the group, that's sometimes harmful because you're going to have students who are out of the box thinkers. You're gonna have it. There's just no, neurodivergent learners are everywhere. You're going to have it. So what I want you to think about then is here's some questions, right? This is a great sort of list of questions to help you analyze your activities. So if you decide to do a family tree, or if let's say you decide to do some kind of uh, two, two truths and a lie is a really, you know, everybody loves that one, right? They go with the kid, tell me two truths and a lie, and we have to figure out what the lie is. So, you know, what's the goal of your activity? Can everyone participate confidently? Does your activity require reading, comprehension, or writing? So I'll tell you, my youngest has dyslexia and uh, is currently in sixth grade, reading at a sixth grade level. But I'll tell you, when she gets some reading, comprehension, writing activities, there's anxiety, right? Um, worked really, really hard to get up to grade level. But in second grade, third grade, and fourth grade, she would opt, she would just fold when it came to somebody handing them a paper, handing her a paper, requiring her to read all this and then write answers down because she's got dyslexia. Um, does your activity honor different cultural frames? And this doesn't matter if you're in an all white school, an all black school, a largely Latinx school, it doesn't matter because there's multiple cultures within race, right? So does your activity leave space for that? Does it honor various student experiences and home constructs? We just talked about, right? Like they might not be coming from a two-parent family. A lot of people are, the, the divorce rate is what, 50, over 50%, right? So chances are you're going to have kids who are in some different home constructs and what their experiences are. Is there an opt-out for kids who aren't comfortable sharing? There's a lot of kids who are not comfortable sharing in front of their peers because it requires them to be vulnerable and they maybe have had experiences in school where they've been shamed, guilted, or bullied for sharing things. So if there is an opt-out and, and you say to the students, that's fine, you don't have to do this, how are you gonna follow up to, have a, to, to forge that relationship with that student and have that student connect to other kids? So they don't just get the pass, the pass is fine, but then how are you gonna follow up? And then the, uh, the last thing that I thought about was, does it place the flow of communication from the students primarily? So when you're doing your activity, is it you up there? Are you up there talking most? Or is the majority of the communication coming from students? You may give directions, but who's really doing the talking, right? And then are you, know, are you hearing the students? So what are some other considerations? What do you guys think? Um, I, you can't talk to me, obviously, so maybe talk to each other just for a minute, but what other things do you think that you should consider? Like given that you just talked about some of your activities, uh, what do you think that you should consider before putting some of these into place in January? Go ahead and take a couple minutes and talk about that. All right, here's, we have about, I don't know, a little less than 20 minutes left. And um, one of the things that I really wanted to talk with you about is how teaching is such a personal endeavor. Like you put who you are into being a teacher. Teaching is not um, a career in which, you know, uh, I don't know how else to say this, but like teaching is really personal. So where do we get our ideas, right? Of what students and schools really look like and sound like, right? What, where do we get our ideas of what's deemed appropriate and acceptable and what is not? And as a person who mentored for 11 years, I'll tell you, you get your ideas from the way you went to school and the way you were raised, right? Uh, so however you experienced school, and the messages and things that you were taught from your community, your family, the, the you know what you were surrounded with is, is where you get your idea 
of what students in schools should probably look like and sound like. And, you know, I'm not sure what your, uh, the last two years of your college has looked like and how much, uh, what kind of classes that have taken that may have challenged some of those thoughts. But I'll tell you, and this is a great quote that comes from a good friend of mine, his name is Derek Mosley. If you were born and raised in the United States, you didn't have a chance. And because we are all swimming in waters of implicit bias, all of us, whether you're African-American, whether you're Latinx, whether you're Asian, whether it doesn't matter. If you were born and raised in the United States, you didn't stand a chance. We all have implicit bias, right? And that impacts how you deal, how you approach students, how you approach school, how you approach your classroom management. It impacts how what you put value on. So if you remember the one of the students in that video said, you know, teachers sometimes are just so focused on numbers, right? And achievement. And our society <laughs> is focused on achieving more and higher scores, right? Look at the testing industry. Your schools are being punished if they get low test scores. That's what they that's what they're focused on, right? It's a reality. It's not it's not a good reality, but they're not measuring schools on the types of students, the people they're becoming, they're measuring schools on how much knowledge can be regurgitated on a standardized test, right? Standardized tests are an unfortunate part of education. It, it, it has to be done. But again, we don't want to relegate kids to just being numbers. So this document that I'm going to open up and share with you is called White Supremacy Culture Characteristics. It's by Tima Okun. She revised it in 2021, and we're just going to take a quick look at a couple of the ideas on here and just see what you guys think about them. And again, I'm sharing this presentation with Kelly, who will then in turn share the um, documents with you as well. And when I first read this document, I was I was a bit like blown away, to be honest. Um, and, and this is controversial. There's there's two sides to this. There's people who agree with this and people who disagree with it. And that's fine. Everybody has that right. But there's some validity to some of this as well. Tima Okun um, came up with this sort of list of white supremacy culture characteristics. And I'm just going to scroll through. This is, you know, she gives you sort of the, the background around, you know, why she calls this white supremacy culture characteristics. And if I'll just read this quick part to you. The, the term white supremacy really refers to ways in which the ruling class elite or the power elite in the colonies when the United States was formed, um, used this pseudo-scientific concept of race to create whiteness and like a hierarchy of racialized value, right? So what, what they wanted to do was obviously they thought white was the best, right? Like pseudo-scientific concept of race. And they did that to disconnect and divide white people from black, indigenous, and people of color. They did this to disconnect black, indigenous, people of color from each other, divide different classes of white people from other white people. So this is where our socioeconomic groups come in. Disconnect and divide each and all of us from the earth, sun, wind, water, things like that. And just disconnect. Up. It's, it's really just meant to disconnect, right? And the power elite constructed this to define who's fully human and who's not. There's a lot more on here, but we're gonna, I just wanna show you what some of the characteristics are. So, mm, perfectionism. This is something that I think a lot of us are brought up with is that there's this one right way to do something, right? Um, and when you have kids who are neurodivergent learners or you have kids from different cultures or kids from different races showing up, expressing themselves in different ways, it's going to go against what you've been taught, what you've learned, right? The way you grew up. So thinking about this, you know, perfectionism is, is you know, little or no appreciation expressed among people for the work that others are doing. Um, a lot of times it's more common to point out either how the person or work is inadequate. So when you're looking at student work, instead of saying you got this one and this one and this one wrong, it's that's the more common thing to do, right? Is to draw attention to immediately what was wrong instead of, hey, you got all of these right? Let's work on these other three. So it's a real subtle shift of the way that you see things, right? 
the other one that I wanted to show you, and so, so how this document is set up is it goes over the characteristics and then it also gives you antidotes, right? So what can you do to combat perfectionism or the run, one right way? Um, but the one I really wanted to show you that I feel like really speaks to teaching <laughs> is this progress is bigger and more and quantity over quality. So I remember when I first started teaching, my principal was like, you got to get through the book. You got to get through the math book, right? Like that's just it. And so it was quantity over quality. He didn't want me to go in depth in mathematical concepts. He wanted breadth. Cover as much as you can get through the book. It was his message to me. So these characteristics really kind of, you know, like they get at our assumptions that we have to do more, be more, and get more done in order to be successful, right? So how is that defined? It's, it's basically how we define success, isn't it? Right? The people who do more and have more and higher numbers are more successful. Um, and in an organization like schools, assume that the goal is to grow. So they add some staff, some projects, serve more people, regardless of how well they can do it, right? It doesn't give value uh, to costs, okay? Um, there isn't really accountability. And there's no cost for, there's no um, ability to consider the cost of growth and social, emotional, embodied, like financial. Like, so they're not looking at the people they're creating, right? We're looking at the outcomes of the numbers, right? This narrow focus on numbers right here without the ability to value your processes or relationships. And then quantity over quality, right? Most or all of the resources are directed towards producing quantitatively measurable goals. I'm sure you all have to do educator effectiveness next year or like at some point, right, when you become a teacher and they're going to tell you, you have to have measurable goals, smart goals. You've all been told smart goals. And I'm not saying don't do it. That's not what I'm saying. I'm safely saying I want you to sort of put on some glasses that let you look at things from different ways, right? Because our educational system is, is not the best in the world and it definitely needs some changes and it's really gonna start changing with the, the teachers that keep coming up if you start looking at things in a different way and start challenging some of these things when the opportunities present themselves. So you're gonna have access to this document um, and you'll be able to take a look at it and sort of what I'm asking you to do with this document is to think about um, what does it mean to you, right? Like, how do you, is there one of these characteristics that potentially resonates with you in your teaching? And that is the very small part of like how you can get started in thinking about your teaching career when you have your own classroom. And even when you go into this student teaching um, uh, placement that you're about to start, it's how can I just look at things a little bit differently, right? Um, all right. I, that is all I have for today. Um, Kelly, I'm not sure if you wanted to jump in and say anything else. Um, I do have a survey that I'd love for you guys to take. Um, Kelly will probably be able to send that out to you in your emails um, at a certain point. But thank you uh, so much for being here today. And it was my honor to be able to share this with you.